Chapter Two of the Gold Hunters by J. D. Borthwick. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Chapter Two Across the Isthmus. On our arrival, we found the population busily employed in celebrating one of their innumerable dias de fiesta. The streets presented a very gay appearance. The natives, all in their gala dresses, were going the rounds of the numerous gaudily ornamented altars which had been erected throughout the town, and mingled with the crowd were numbers of Americans in every variety of California emigrant costume. The scene was further enlivened by the music, or rather the noise, of fifes, drums, and fiddles, with singing and chanting inside the churches, together with squibs and crackers, the firing of cannon, and the continual ringing of bells. The town is built on a small promontory, and is protected, on the two sides facing the sea, by batteries, and on the land side, by a high wall and a moat. A large portion of the town, however, lies on the outside of this. Most of the houses are built of wood, two stories high, painted with bright colors, and with a corridor and veranda on the upper story. But the best houses are of stone or sun-dried bricks plastered over and painted. The churches are all of the same style of architecture which prevails throughout Spanish America. They appeared to be in a very neglected state, bushes and even trees growing out of the crevices of the stones. The towers and pinnacles are ornamented with a profusion of pearl oyster shells, which, shining brightly in the sun, produce a very curious effect. On the altars is a great display of gold and silver ornaments and images, but the interiors, in other respects, are quite in keeping with the dilapidated, uncared-for appearance of the outside of the buildings. The natives are white, black, and every intermediate shade of color, being a mixture of Spanish, Negro, and Indian blood. Many of the women are very handsome, and on Sundays and holidays they dress very showily, mostly in white dresses with bright colored ribbons, red or yellow slippers without stockings, flowers in their hair, and round their necks gold chains, frequently composed of coins of various sizes linked together. They have a fashion of making their hair useful as well as ornamental, and it is not unusual to see the ends of three or four half-smoked cigars sticking out from the folds of their hair at the back of the head, for, though they smoke a great deal, they never seem to finish a cigar at one smoking. It is amusing to watch the old women going to church. They come up, smoking vigorously, with a cigar in full blast, but when they get near the door, they reverse it, putting the lighted end into their mouth, and in this way they take half a dozen stiff pulls at it, which seems to have the effect of putting it out. They then stow away the stump in some of the recesses of their back hair, to be smoked out on a future occasion. The native population of Panama is about 8,000, but at this time there was also a floating population of Americans, varying from two to three thousand, all on their way to California, some being detained for two or three months waiting for a steamer to come round the Horn, some waiting for sailing vessels, while others, more fortunate, found the steamer for which they had tickets ready for them on their arrival. Passengers returning home from San Francisco did not remain any time at Panama, but went right on across the Isthmus to Chagres. The Americans, though so greatly inferior in number to the natives, displayed so much more life and activity, even in doing nothing, that they formed by far the more prominent portion of the population. The main street of the town was densely crowded, day and night, with Americans in bright red flannel shirts, with a universal revolver and bowie knife 
conspicuously displayed at their backs. Most of the principal houses in the town had been converted into hotels, which were kept by Americans and bore upon large signs the favorite hotel names of the United States. There were also numbers of large American stores or shops of various descriptions equally obtruding upon the attention of the public by the extent of their English signs, while by a few lines of bad Spanish scrawled on a piece of paper at the side door, the poor natives were informed, as a mere matter of courtesy, that they also might enter in and buy, if they had the wherewithal to pay. Here and there, indeed, some native, with more enterprise than his neighbors, intimated to the public, that is to say to the Americans, in a very modest sign and in very bad English, that he had something or other to sell. But his energy was all theoretical, for on going into his store you would find him half asleep in his hammock, out of which he would not rouse himself if he could possibly avoid it. You were welcome to buy as much as you pleased, but he seemed to think it very hard that you could not do so without giving him at the same time the trouble of selling. Although all foreigners were spoken of as los americanos by the natives, there were among them men from every country in Europe. The Frenchmen were the most numerous, some of whom kept stores and very good restaurants. There were also several large gambling saloons, which were always crowded, especially on Sundays, with natives and Americans gambling at the Spanish game of Monte, and, of course, specimens were not wanting of that great American institution, the drinking saloon, at the bars of which a brisk business was done in brandy smashes, whiskey skins, and all the other refreshing compounds for which Americans are so justly celebrated. Living in Panama was pretty hard. The hotels were all crammed full. The accommodation they afforded was somewhat in the same style as at Gorgona, and they were consequently not very inviting places. Those who did not live in hotels had sleeping quarters in private houses, and resorted to the restaurants for their meals, which was a much more comfortable mode of life. Ham, beans, chicken, eggs, and rice were the principal articles of food. The beef was dreadfully tough, stringy, and tasteless, and was hardly ever eaten by the Americans, as it was generally found to be very unwholesome. There was here at this time a great deal of sickness and absolute misery among the Americans. Diarrhea and fever were the prevalent diseases. The deaths were very numerous, but were frequently either the result of the imprudence of the patient himself or of the total indifference as to his fate on the part of his neighbors, and the consequent want of any care or attendance whatever. The heartless selfishness one saw and heard of was truly disgusting. The principle of every man for himself was most strictly followed out, and a sick man seemed to be looked upon as a thing to be avoided, as a hindrance to one's own individual progress. There was a hospital attended by American physicians and supported to a great extent by Californian generosity, but it was quite incapable of accommodating all the sick, and many a poor fellow, having exhausted his funds during his long detention here, found, when he fell sick, that in parting with his money, he had lost the only friend he had, and was allowed to die as little cared for as if he had been a dog. An American characteristic is a weakness for quack medicines and specifics, and numbers of men here fell victims to the national mania, chiefly Yankees and Western men. Persons coming from a northern climate to such a place as Panama are naturally apt at first to experience some slight derangement of their general health, 
which with proper treatment is easily rectified, but these fellows were all provided with cholera preventive, fever preventive, and boxes of pills for the prevention and the cure of every known disease. The moment they imagined that there was anything wrong with them, they became alarmed and dosed themselves with all the medicines they could get a hold of, so that when they really were taken ill, they were already half poisoned with the stuff they had been swallowing. Many killed themselves by excessive drinking of the wretched liquor, which was sold under the name of brandy, and others by eating ravenously of fruit, green or ripe, at all hours of the day, or by living, for the sake of economy, on gingerbread and spruce beer, which are also American weaknesses, and of which there were several enterprising Yankee manufacturers. The sickness was no doubt much increased by the outrageously filthy state of the town. There seemed to be absolutely no arrangement for cleanliness whatever, and the heavy rains which fell and washed down the streets were all that saved the town from being swallowed up in the accumulation of its own corruption. Among the Americans en route for California were men of all classes, professional men, merchants, laborers, sailors, farmers, mechanics, and numbers of long, gaunt western men, with rifles as long as themselves. The hotels were too crowded to allow of any distinction of persons, and they were, accordingly, conducted on ultra-democratic principles. Some faint idea of the style of thing might be formed from a notice which was posted up in the bar-room of the most fashionable hotel. It ran as follows. Gentlemen are requested to wear their coats at table, if they have them handy. This intimation, of course, in effect, amounted to nothing at all. But at the same time there was a great deal in it. It showed that the landlord, being above vulgar prejudices himself, saw the necessity, in order to please all his guests, of overcoming the mutual prejudices existing between broadcloth and fine linen, and red flannel with no linen, sanctioning the wearing of coats at table on the part of the former by making a public request that they would do so, while of the shirt-sleeve gentlemen those who had coats and refused to wear them could still glory in the knowledge that they were defying all interference with their individual rights, and in behalf of the really coatless, those who could not call a coat their own, the idea was kindly suggested that that garment was only absent because it was not handy. As may be supposed, such a large and motley population of foreigners, confined in such a place as Panama, without any occupation, were not remarkably quiet or orderly. Gambling, drinking, and cock-fighting were the principal amusements, and drunken rows and fights, in which pistols and knives were freely used, were of frequent occurrence. The 4th of July was celebrated by the Americans in great style. The proceedings were conducted as is customary on such occasions in the United States, a procession was formed, which, headed by a number of fiddles, drums, bugles, and other instruments, all playing Yankee Doodle in a very free and independent manner, marched to the place of celebration, a circular canvas structure where a circus company had been giving performances. When all were assembled, the Declaration of Independence was read, and the orator of the day made a flaming speech on the subject of George the Third and the universal Yankee nation. A gentleman then got up and, speaking in Spanish, explained to the native population of the assembly what all the row was about, after which the meeting dispersed, 
and the further celebration of the day was continued at the bars of the different hotels. I met with an accident here which laid me up for several weeks. I suffered a good deal and passed a most weary time. All the books I could get a hold of did not last me more than a few days, and I had then no other pastime than to watch the hummingbirds buzzing about the flowers which grew around my window. As soon as I was able to walk, I took passage in a bark about to sail for San Francisco. She carried about forty passengers, and as she had ample cabin accommodation, we were so far comfortable enough. The company was, as might be expected, very miscellaneous. Some were respectable men, and others were precious vagabonds. When we had been out but a few days, a fever broke out on board, which was not, however, of a very serious character. I got a touch of it, and would have cured myself very easily, but there was a man on board who passed for a doctor, having shipped as such. He had been physicking the others, and I reluctantly consented to allow him to doctor me also. He began by giving me some horrible emetic, which, however, had no effect. So he continued to repeat it, dose after dose, each dose half a tumbler full, with still no effect, till at last he had given me so much of it that he began to be alarmed for the consequences. I was a little alarmed myself, and putting my finger down my throat, I very soon relieved myself of all his villainous compounds. I think I fainted after it. I know I felt as if I were going to faint, and shortly afterwards was sensible of a lapse of time which I could not account for. But on inquiring of some of my fellow passengers, I could find no one who had so far interested himself on my account as to be able to give me any information on the subject. I took my own case in hand after that, and very soon got rid of the fever, although the emetic treatment had so used me up that for a fortnight I was hardly able to stand. We afterwards discovered that this man was only now making his debut as a physician. He had graduated, however, as a shoemaker, a farmer, and I don't know what else besides. Latterly he had practiced as a horse dealer, and I have no doubt it was some horse medicine which he administered to me so freely. We had only two deaths on board, and in justice to the doctor, I must say he was not considered to have been the cause of either of them. One case was that of a young man who, while the doctor was treating him for fever, was at the same time privately treating himself to large doses, taken frequently, of bad brandy, of which he had an ample stock stowed away under his bed. About a day and a half settled him. The other was a much more melancholy case. He was a young Swede, such a delicate, effeminate fellow, that he seemed quite out of place among the rough and noisy characters who formed the rest of the party. A few days before we left Panama, a steamer had arrived from San Francisco with a great many cases of cholera on board. Numerous deaths had occurred in Panama, and considerable alarm prevailed there in consequence. The Swede was attacked with fever like the rest of us, but he had no force in him either mental or bodily, to bear up against sickness under such circumstances, and the fear of cholera had taken such possession of him that he insisted upon it that he had cholera, and that he would die of it that night. His lamentations were most piteous, but all attempts to reassure him were in vain. He very soon became delirious, and died raving before morning. None of us were doctors enough to know exactly what he died of, but the general belief was that he frightened 
himself to death. The church service was read over him by the supercargo, many of the passengers merely leaving their cards to be present at the ceremony, and as soon as he was launched over the side, resuming their game where they had been interrupted, and this, moreover, was on a Sunday morning. In future, the captain prohibited all card playing on Sundays, but throughout the voyage nearly one half of the passengers spent the whole day and half the night in playing the favorite game of poker, which is something like brag, and at which they cheated each other in the most barefaced manner, so causing perpetual quarrels, which, however, never ended in a fight, for the reason, as it seemed to me, that as every one wore his bowie knife, the prospect of getting his opponent's knife between his ribs deterred each man from drawing his own, or offering any violence whatever. The poor Swede had no friends on board. Nobody knew who he was, where he came from, or anything at all about him. And so his effects were, a few days after his death, sold at auction by order of the captain. One of the passengers, who had been an auctioneer in the States, officiating on the occasion. Great rascalities were frequently practiced at this time by those engaged in conveying passengers in sailing vessels from Panama to San Francisco. There were such numbers of men waiting anxiously in Panama to take the first opportunity that offered of reaching California that there was no difficulty in filling any old tub of a ship with passengers. And when once men arrived in San Francisco, they were generally too much occupied in making dollars to give any trouble on account of the treatment they had received on the voyage. Many vessels were consequently dispatched with a load of passengers, most shamefully ill supplied with provisions, even what they had been of the most inferior quality, and it often happened that they had to touch in distress at the intermediate ports for the ordinary necessaries of life. We very soon found that our ship was no exception. For the first few days we fared pretty well, but by degrees one article after another became used up, and by the time we had been out a fortnight we had absolutely nothing to eat and drink but salt pork, musty flour, and bad coffee. No mustard, vinegar, sugar, pepper, or anything of the sort to render such food at all palatable. It may be imagined how delightful it was in recovering from fever, when one naturally has a craving for something good to eat, to have no greater delicacy in the way of nourishment than gruel made of musty flour, ah, naturel. There was great indignation among the passengers. A lot of California emigrants were not a crowd to be trifled with, and the idea of pitching the supercargo overboard was quite seriously entertained. But, fortunately for himself, he was a very plausible man, and succeeded in talking them into the belief that he was not to blame. We would have gone into some port for supplies, but of such grub as we had there was no scarcity on board, and we preferred making the most of it to incurring delay by going in on the coast, where calms and light winds are so prevalent. We killed a porpoise occasionally and ate him. The liver is the best part, and the only part generally eaten, being something like a pig's liver, and by no means bad. I had frequently tasted the meat at sea before. It is exceedingly hard, tough, and stringy, like the very worst beefsteak that can possibly be imagined. And I used to think it barely eatable, when thoroughly disguised in sauce and spices. But now, after being so long under a severe salt-pork treatment, I thought porpoise steak a very delicious dish, 
even without any condiment, to heighten its intrinsic excellence. We had been out about six weeks when we sighted a ship many miles off, going the same way as ourselves, and the captain determined to board her and endeavor to get some of the articles of which we were so much in need. There was great excitement among the passengers. All wanted to accompany the captain in his boat, but to avoid making invidious distinctions, he refused to take anyone unless he would pull an oar. I was one of the four who volunteered to do so, and we left the ship amid clamorous injunctions not to forget sugar, beef, molasses, vinegar, and so on, whatever each man most longed for. We had four or five Frenchmen on board who earnestly entreated me to get them even one bottle of oil. We had a long pull, as the stranger was in no hurry to heave to for us, and on coming up to her we found her to be a Scotch bark, bound also for San Francisco, without passengers, but very nearly as badly off as ourselves. She could not spare us anything at all, but the captain gave us an invitation to dinner, which we accepted with the greatest pleasure. It was Sunday, and so the dinner was, of course, the best they could get up. It only consisted of fresh pork, the remains of their last pig, and duff, but with mustard to the pork and sugar to the duff, it seemed to us a most sumptuous banquet and not having the immediate prospect of such another for some time to come, we made the most of the present opportunity. In fact, we cleared the table. I don't know what the Scotch skipper thought of us, but if he really could have spared us anything, the ravenous way in which we demolished his dinner would surely have softened his heart. On arriving again alongside our own ship, with the boat empty as when we left her, we were greeted by a row of very long faces looking down on us over the side. Not a word was said, because they had watched us with the glass leaving the other vessel, and had seen that nothing was handed into the boat. And when we described the splendid dinner we had just eaten, their faces lengthened so much and assumed such a wistful expression that it seemed a wanton piece of cruelty to have mentioned the circumstance at all. But, after all, our hard fare did not cause us much distress. We got used to it, and besides, a passage to California was not like a passage to any other place. Everyone was so confident of acquiring an immense fortune there in an incredibly short time, that he was already making his plans for the future enjoyment of it, and present difficulties and hardships were not sufficiently appreciated. The time passed pleasantly enough. All were disposed to be cheerful, and amongst so many men there are always some who afford amusement for the rest. Many found constant occupation in trading off their coats, hats, boots, trunks, or anything they possessed. I think scarcely anyone went ashore in San Francisco with a single article of clothing which he possessed in Panama, and there was hardly an article of any man's wardrobe which by the time our voyage was over had not at one time been the property of every other man on board the ship. We had one cantankerous old Englishman on board, who used to roll out most volubly good round English oaths, greatly to the amusement of some of the American passengers, for the English style of cursing and swearing is very different from that which prevails in the States. This old fellow was made a butt for all manner of practical jokes. He had a way of going to sleep during the day in all sorts of places, and when the dinner bell rang, he would find himself tied hand and foot. 
they sewed up the sleeves of his coat and then bet him long odds he could not put it on and take it off again within a minute. They made up cigars for him with some powder in the inside, and, in fact, the jokes played off upon him were endless, the great fun being apparently to hear him swear, which he did most heartily. He always fancied himself ill and said that quinine was the only thing that would save him. But the quinine, like everything else on board, was all used up. However, one man put up some papers of flour and salt and gave them to him as quinine, saying he had just found them in looking over his trunk. Constant inquiries were then made after the old man's health, when he declared the quinine was doing him a world of good and that his appetite was much improved. He was so much teased at last that he used to go about with a naked bowie knife in his hand, with which he threatened to do awful things to whoever interfered with him. But even this did not secure him much peace, and he was such a dreadfully crabbed old rascal that I thought the stirring up he got was quite necessary to keep him sweet. After a wretchedly long passage, during which we experienced nothing but calms, light winds, and heavy contrary gales, we entered the Golden Gate of San Francisco Harbor with the first and only fair wind we were favored with, and came to anchor before the city about eight o'clock in the evening. End of chapter 2